Welcome to Lingua Mania, live Friday here at the Ashmolean Museum. I'm Kirsten Shepard Barr, and I'm acting director of Torch for this term. Here this evening, we have the opportunity to share research with the wider public and enjoy a late night at the museum. Lingua Mania has been curated by the research project team, Creative Multilingualism, it's a poster behind me. Torch is the Oxford Research Center in the Humanities, and we support and facilitate multidisciplinary research and enable wider and public engagement. And on that note, it's now my pleasure to introduce Wenqing Uyang. She is professor of Arabic and Comparative Literature at the School of Oriental and African Studies. Wenqing Uyang was born in Taiwan and raised in Libya. She has studied at Tripoli University and Columbia University in New York. She taught Arabic language, literature, and culture at Columbia, University of Chicago, and University of Virginia before she moved to London. Wenqing's talk will be, Do Objects Speak? Thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm used to giving conference papers, but I'm not used to speaking in a museum, so I'm finding myself a little bit apprehensive. So my title is actually twofold. Do objects speak? And in how many languages? Um, and this is an example of what I'm thinking we can use, example we can use to talk about multilingualism. Um, I, I'm sure all of us are multilingual here, then how do we, what is multilingualism? How do we talk about multilingualism? And what is the relationship between multilingualism and creativity? Multilingualism, when we talk about it, we think of people who speak many languages. Also, we think of an environment in which many languages are spoken. We also think of a literary work that uses languages in a different way, possibly combining different languages in one language. In the way we talk about multilingualism, I think, we still think of language as discrete, sovereign, and distinct. For someone like me, who I think is multilingual or trilingual. I speak Arabic, English, and Chinese equally well. I write in these languages. When I think about how I write Arabic and how I write English or how I write Chinese, I don't think of these languages as discrete, sovereign, or distinct. When I speak Arabic, I can hear or I can see English in it. When I speak Chinese, I can see Arabic in it. When I speak Arabic, I can see Chinese in it. So I think language is inherently multilingual as well, right? And it is inherently multicultural, right? And it gets better. It becomes richer when it engages with other languages. Right? And most of the literature that Jane and I, my collaborator, my co-investigator here, will be looking at will exhibit that kind of feature that is at the heart of literary transformation as well. So how do we talk about this idea that language is multilingual in itself? Right? And I'm going to use a Chinaware objects to think about it. Um, how many of you came through the China Gallery today? Rare room 37, 38, 39. And did you see the blue and white Chinaware on your way? Right? Did you think of them as multilingual or multicultural? Multicultural? Possibly. OK, so let's look at this. I'm going to start with something that's very familiar to all of us, the blue, the blue willow pattern. Right? And Blue Willow, do you think it's Chinese, perhaps? Yes, it is Chinese. And right in the history or the literature about it, this is supposed to be right, a visual translation of a poem. Two birds flying high, a Chinese vessel sailing by, a bridge with three men, sometimes four, a willow tree hanging over a Chinese temple. There it stands 
built upon the river sands an apple tree with apples on a crooked fence to end my song. Right? It's Chinese, and the motif is Chinese, and it sounds very Chinese. Right? But it was the invention of the English and European craftsmen or ceramic artists in the 18th century. And the most famous of them was Thomas Minton. He was an English potter right, who had a, a sort of a factory in Stoke-on-Trent. And that was when, right, because Chinese blue and white was very popular, he invented, right, or the artist invented this pattern in imitation of Chinese blue and white. And this pattern, this design is actually chinoiserie, European adaptation of Chinese motifs, right? And this was very popular in England and in Europe, right? 19th century European blue and white, blue willow made in Europe, right? And this set of ruins was found, right, in the house, the ruins of William Tunnell's Edge Hill house in the 19th century, blue willow. Right? And this was made in Delft, in Holland, in the 19th century as well. Now, what you see here, and I'm making transitions through visual language, right? And you can see sort of Chinese motifs, Chinese, but maybe a little bit arabesque. Now, here I'm going to pause and going to suggest that if we use object to think about it, blue and white. And white as language, maybe is in its infancy. And blue, as well as the shape, as its grammar, syntax, and semantics, right? That gain more as the white travels across cultures. Let's see how it goes, right? This is a blue, a Ming Dynasty blue, uh, blue and white porcelain. And you begin to see the blue willow pattern without the willow, right? The house, the pagoda, birds, right? And this is the Chinese term, Qinghua Ci, for blue and white, right? And Qinghua Ci covers a wide range of white pottery and porcelain decorated under the glaze with a blue pigment, right? Generally cobalt oxide. And guess what? This pigment was imported from Persia in the 14th century, right? It was widely exported, this Ming Qinghua Ci, right? And inspired imitative wares in Islamic ceramics and later European tin glaze earthware, such as Delftware, which we saw, right? And Jing Dezhen is the, one of the most famous cities where porcelain, Chinese porcelain was made. So I'm using an example from this, right? And if you look at this object, it has an Islamic shape and motifs but it was made in China, right? More, right? These, to me, look more like arabesque, floral patterns that Ch you don't find as many in Chinese, but we'll see some Chinese images. So you have the 14th century Yuan Dynasty plate, Ming Dynasty plate, and I want you to look at the patterns, right? Like 15th century, right? 17th century, the same from the same city, town, 17th century, 17th century. Now, Ming exports, right? And these are probably exported to the Islamic lands, and you can see a little bit change in the lines and the motifs. Okay. Right? Exports. Lines and motifs. It's picking up different languages as it's picking up 
different audiences and consumers. Now, you begin to see Persian writing on the vase on your left. It's picking up not Chinese languages, Persian language as well. Of course, it's written in Arabic script, right? Export, Arabic script, arabesque, right? Arabesque, Arabic script, and Persian as well, right? Now, we look at the exports to Europe. The motifs change. The patterns of the blue change. Europe, right? Now, if we zoom back, turn backward, and look at Islamic blue and white, Arabic in the middle of a plate, with m simple decorations around the edges, and start comparing, right? Japanese, Delft, Dutch, Ottoman, mosque lamp, arabesque and Arabic writing, arabesque shape, Persian. Now, can we come back to what languages do objects speak? In the case of blue and white, we can see words, Chinese characters on Chinese plate, Arabic words in an Islamic sort of blue and white, right? Think of languages that appear. Motifs, arabesque, dragons in Chinese, right? European, a mill, Arabic, words and arabesque, right? And then you think of colors. There are the same colors, similar colors, but not exactly the same. Now, if we think of this as language that travels around and picks up more nuances and complexity as it travels, right? We can also imagine the travels of a language via the objects. And this is a map of Ming ceramics right, and its circulation around the world, right. So if that's the case then, we can imagine, right, that each language is inherently multilingual and multicultural, but the more languages and cultures we expose it to, the richer it becomes. But more interestingly, right, and you never know what your household objects can tell you about multilingualism. And if you experiment with your household objects and look at it and start thinking about it and thinking about where it has come from and what kind of languages through colors, motifs, and lines that he's uh, picked up, I bet you will find that your household is multicultural and multilingual. Thank you. <laughs>